yourself, please. Yes, uh, my name is Edward Michaud. I'm president of Trident Research and Recovery Incorporated, a marine salvage company that is presently involved in the salvage of a German U-boat off Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Could you tell us uh, how you first heard about this U-boat? Well, the initial uh, investigation into it uh, occurred uh, upon interviewing a, a tug skipper uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. That was the first hint uh, we had of its existence. And that was uh, approximately eight years ago. And what, was this someone that you just met? Uh, at the time it was. Yes, it was. Uh, Mr. Warren Leggett. Uh, he was a, a tug skipper, as I said and was fairly knowledgeable about at least the existence of this vessel. Uh, was not familiar with any of the circumstances surrounding its sinking, but was familiar with the existence. And uh, after priming him quite often, uh, it led to other sources of information. What is it that's uh, so interesting or unique about this particular wreck? I would have to say that the most fascinating aspect of this vessel was the fact that it's not supposed to exist. Uh, all contemporary accounts and official histories state that the vessel was never even built, yet we obviously have it in our backyard. If, if it wasn't supposed to exist, how did you find out anything more about it? Uh, uh, the process of discovery began by actually discovering that the vessel was not of the type we expected it to be. It was much larger, uh, much larger than any known German U-boat type uh, known to exist during the war. What um, ideas uh, have you managed to pull together about what it was doing there? Well, it's a combination of facts and theories. Uh, essentially, the bottom line is uh, what we've come up with is that the vessel was here to negotiate an armistice on behalf of German industri industrialists. That's it in a nutshell, with complicity of U.S. State Department personnel as well as some intelligence personnel. So can you take us through the chronology of events around about the time um, from when the U-boat may be set off from Germany? Our records indicate the vessel departed Germany on or about July 20th of 1944. Uh, the record is, is pretty indicative of the 20th of July, the same day as the attempted coup assass uh, assassination coup against Adolf Hitler, as it turns out. Uh, this makes sense, of course, because the people involved, as we found out, with this vessel were most probably uh, also involved in the Nazi opposition in Germany in 1944. So would it be fair to say that these were the good guys in Germany? It's hard to say whether they're good or bad guys. These were the same people who put Hitler in power in the first place. So it's a matter of opinion, I suppose. Uh, I, I suppose it, as a uh, description, a general description, you could say they were the German good guys if you consider there were such people. Uh, but yes, the, you could say they were the German good guys. Mm. Well, I don't think they necessarily they were. No. But, um, um, so who, who um, what's your, what's your, what are your ideas around that uh, assassination attempt? What was going on in Germany at the time? Well, as, uh, as many people know, there were many assassination attempts on Hitler. Uh, the most uh, effective, of course, was the, uh, the, no the last recorded attempt on the 20th of July, when a bomb was placed uh, inside his briefing room at the Wolfschanze uh, complex in Poland. And that was, turned out to be a failure, of course. But uh, essentially, the people involved in this vessel and some of the industrialists and military personnel, which obviously assisted it to some degree, uh, had also arranged previous attempts on Hitler's life. Uh, it was typically a gangster state in Germany. One must consider this. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they were trying to do good for the nation, but rather do good for themselves. Hitler was in the process of destroying his country and its industry. So what was their motive? Their motive was personal survival, corporate and personal survival. That's the bottom line. So once this uh, U-boat set off over here, what, what was the pattern of events across the Atlantic and when it arrived? Uh, again, in a nutshell, uh, proceeding across the Atlantic from the 20th of July, uh, we have strong indication that she proceeded uh, out, the, out of the Baltic Sea from Dynia, Poland, departing from Dania, uh, proceeded past uh, to the north of the British Isles, and then south uh, between Iceland and uh, the Irish coast, and then down into the North Atlantic, and then to the Central Atlantic towards the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. Okay, and uh, what happened when it arrived? Uh, very interesting. Uh, 
When she arrived, obviously she was spotted way before she arrived on the coast. She was spotted several times by U.S. Uh, spotter planes and British spotter planes. In fact, uh, both U.S. and British Ultra were communicating with each other, asking each other if they knew anything about this vessel. Who's Ultra? Uh, Ultra was the top secret coding uh, uh, code and cipher school in Great Britain, and in the United States it was Naval Intelligence specifically. U.S. Army also had their version of Ultra. Ultra was code decrypt, essentially. And at the time it was the most classified secret of the war. Okay, so when it arrived? When did it arrive? No, well, what happened when it arrived? Well, ah. the dates and what happened? Well, she arrived uh, approximately on the 24th of August, 1944, from what we can tell by the records. Uh, she uh, was uh, proceeding close to the coast. Obviously, uh, the record indicates she was trying to find a good area for sending a transmission and possibly for a rendezvous, rendezvous point as well. Uh, some of the records indicate that there was a point jig uh, in the records uh, referred to by Allied intelligence as well as uh, some ultra decrypts. Uh, we're not too sure what that might mean, but it might refer to the point of rendezvous that this vessel was proceeding to. And this just happens to be 14 miles southeast of Chatham, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in very shallow water, needless to say. And uh, when she arrived on the 25th of August, she surfaced uh, approximately just before su sunset. And she was in the process of sending out a transmission, as we found out later from a naval intelligence veteran, a highly classified uh, top secret enigma transmission in diplomatic code, a, what they call a B bar, high priority. And she was in an S5 location, ONI parlance for meaning very close to the station. The station that intercepted her transmission was a U.S. Naval uh, radio intercept station in Chatham, Massachusetts. And so it didn't take them long to get a fix on the vessel. Uh, as it turns out, uh, there were no vessels or airships or planes deployed to intercept her that we know of. Uh, certainly there are no records indicating that nobody is deployed directly to her to intercept her, which we thought very strange. But we did find out that the Naval Airship K-25 did proceed to the area. And there are very strong indications, according to the official records, the existing records, that she was attacked and indeed sunk by a naval airship uh, shortly after s submitting her transmission. So uh, what, I, what I find difficult to understand is if it was if there were communications going on with the top level mm -hmm. um, in, in Washington between this U-boat and them, um, uh, how how come? The, the, the boat was sunk. Do you think it was under orders from Washington? Good question and a good point to raise. No, uh, it's obvious uh, by all accounts the vessel was not purposely sunk by UN, any U.S. Naval Command or any U.S. Command for that matter. Uh, she was sunk obviously by accident. Uh, the bottom line again is that she was uh, sunk by a naval airship that was simply out doing its job and had no idea what the vessel was up to but only knew that it was an enemy vessel in, in Allied territory that needed to be attacked. And so what evidence do you have for that, though? Uh, what we do have are the Eastern Sea Frontier reports detailing the airship's traverse to that area and her activity in that area. We also have a naval intelligence decrypt of a last transmission sent by the, by the U-boat in plain uh, transmission, no, plain text, no coding, obviously sent in the last, last hasty seconds of the vessel's existence, saying, quote, and being attacked by aircraft, unquote. And that was on 25 August in a place uh, known as, uh, as a local transmission. But, but um, what, uh, what was going on to, to or what, what evidence do you have that the uh, uh, blimp, the naval blimp that was attacking the boat was um, not following orders from Washington or from a higher level? Well, there, are, we, there is a lack of documentation uh, giving commands to the airship specifying an attack. Mm -hmm. There are commands to, uh, to her uh, asking her to proceed to the area of the vessel's location and search, but there are no records indicating an attack. Uh, but there are some very curious movements at the time the airship arrives on the scene and shortly thereafter when uh, a Red Able uh, patrol is conducted by two surface craft, uh, two Coast Guard boats and a sub chaser. And they make some very strange maneuvers in the area as if they're looking for flotsam and jetsam from a sunk vessel, which is the obvious indication. 
And their logs tend to agree with this as well. Right. Now, um, how about uh, the pilot of the, uh, mm. the person that did the sinking? Well, the person that claims a sinking, uh, he seems to be off on a few details, but he's amazingly accurate on many others. And uh, many people discount his statements, whereas we look at what he says and compare it with the official record and what we have found on site. And amazingly, what he says seems to match up with what we find. So what's he been saying? Uh, for example, his account was that he dropped uh, two depth charges over the submarine as it was trying to submerge to lower its, its silhouette as a target. And while it was happening, he dropped two depth charges. One detonated, and the other one was a dud. The one that detonated is number 350 Torpex depth charge. Uh, detonated when it reached approximately 10 feet, directly over the what, what we now know as the U-boat's galley. And when he said he, he saw the de de detonation of the charge, when it went off, he said it was right behind the conning tower. And sure enough, the hole we found in the wreck, the detonation hole, the damage hole, was right behind the conning tower. And what he said he saw floating to the surface was uh, what he believed to be heads of lettuce. Well, this made sense because we know the damaged area was the galley. We know that from site surveys. So it seemed to match up pretty closely. And what he had to relate, the airship pilot had to relate when he returned, showed an immediate naval cover-up, certainly the indications we've been getting, because he was immediately transferred the next day to Recife, Brazil. Sorry, to where? To Recife, Brazil, Naval Air Station. So uh, he was removed from the scene as quickly as possible, along with the rest of the crew who were transferred to other bases throughout the country. Is there any other evidence that um, him sinking this boat wasn't viewed um, um, uh, too happily by some of his seniors? Very much so. Uh, he was asked repeatedly by his naval intelligence inter interrogator whether he actually wanted to file a report mentioning the attack. And his words, quote unquote, was, yes, damn it, I sank a sub and I want credit for it. And the, uh, and the naval intelligence uh, personnel reply was that, okay. And he marched him into the next room. This is upon his return, of course, uh, a few hours later. And when he got into the next room, uh, he asked him again all the questions that are in the, the war report. And he says, okay, you're dismissed. And the next, uh, Joe thought it was all over, you know, the pilot that sank this. And the next thing he knew, he was transferred the next day. That's all he knew about it. Uh, if we found it very strange because uh, the pilot had mentioned that the film chronal, uh, showing the attack, the stern gun, gun camera on the blimp obviously caught the detonation of the charge on the sub, but uh, it disappeared. And according to the pilot, uh, he had heard it was flown to Washington, D.C. the next day and just disappeared in the files. It cannot be found even today. So, right, who, who, is, this, who is this person? What's the guy? Uh, we'll, we'll just say Joe for now, right. but we don't want to use his last name right now. Okay, but you've yeah. managed to track him down? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Off, so off the record, I'll tell you all about it. Okay. But right. uh, certainly uh, on the record, I just want to keep his last name out for now. Right, okay. Um, um, so, um, what does, what, what, um, have you any idea who is actually on this boat? Actually, we don't. Uh, we can only surmise. Uh, we do know that there are a lot of paper trails leading up to the deployment of this vessel, and there are extremely strong indications that uh, there could very well be rep have been representatives of German industry. And that is the best scenario, everything that fits at this point. Uh, certainly, whoever was on board, we, have, we firmly believe represented German industry as a whole. And do you think that they um, expected to, to, to for the Americans to show them, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, remembering, of course, that 1944 is at the height of war. Yes. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were heading off to the United States. Um, what makes you think <coughs> that, that uh, or what, might, what would have made them think, maybe, that they would get a good reception? Well, it's a long and complex uh, story behind that but essentially the whole story uh, behind uh, a German attempted uh, armistice as well as uh, a safe haven if you will uh, commenced in November of 1943 we know this from the existing record in which uh, Martin Bormann specifically commenced what they call uh, Acton Fuhrland 
which means action land of fire, referring to the southern geographical area of Argentina. Uh, specifically, that operation dealt with German U-boats proceeding to South America. Uh, one, to hide uh, potential Nazi war criminals, and two, to hide uh, securities accumulated by the Nazi Reich throughout the years. Now, as we go into 1944, there are numerous attempts by these same people, as well as by additional uh, anti-Nazi hardliners who wish to end the war for their own benefits and uh, for what they think is best for their country, but mostly for themselves in corporate interests, corporate securities for post-war interests. And uh, what happened was there were many contacts between such as uh, the Dulles brothers of U.S. intelligence in Switzerland and German emissaries, and this is well documented. There are also many contacts with Franz von Papen, uh, the amb German ambassador in Turkey, between uh, himself and uh, U.S. intelligence personnel both in Switzerland and in Lisbon, Portugal. So is it possible that the Americans were expecting this boat, or do you think, uh, I mean, is that possible or not? I would say most definitely somebody uh, in the United States expected the arrival of this vessel. There is no doubt about that, and every indication is that it could very well have been the State Department. For one thing, we do know that the transmission she was sending was earmarked for the White House map room. We know that from an, uh, an interview from a naval intelligence veteran, Preston Howley, who was stationed in Chatham and intercepted the transmission. And it was bound to the White House map room, which we know is controlled by the State Department, or was at that time. What sort of place would the White House map room have been? What kind of operations go on there? White House map room was not a map room, really. Uh, it was a combined intelligence service. Uh, Army, Navy, uh, Army Air Force, uh, FBI, OSS, what have you, naval intelligence. And it was staffed by many uh, uniforms at that time, but it was all run by the State Department. And it was equipped very heavily with uh, decoding equipment. And it just happened to be equipped with a Geheimschreiber, a German coding machine, diplomatic coding machine, that we know was supplied to them by the German resistance in November of 1943. So we found that very interesting. And it was the only Geheimschreiber that was in the United States at that time. So this would have been used to de decrypt the message from the U-boat? It was the only other coding machine that could understand the coding from this U-boat. Okay, going back to, to getting back to... Uh, um, the last few years and your your discovery of this. Um, what's, what sort of stage is the wreck at now? Hmm. What sort of stage is the salvage operation at? Right now we proceeded very cautiously through uh, strict archaeological guidelines. Uh, we know that uh, it is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a war grave. So we have to proceed very cautiously. We also have to proceed very cautiously in our contents. Now we don't know exactly what is inside the vessel. We do know there are some airtight sections in this vessel. But we do know that paperwork holds up well inside the, the hulls of submarines. And since there are airtight sections, there could very well be some very interesting revelations in the form of documentation. And if these people in this U-boat are bound here for an armistice, combined with uh, possibly uh, uh, providing safe haven for securities, there's going to be indications of it inside the boat. No doubt about that. And what state is the wreck in itself? I would have to say overall it's in excellent condition, considering uh, it is very heavily buried in sand. Uh, the conning tower was very heavily armored, so it held up rather well. Uh, it's got an awful lot of fishing net in it, and the site conditions are horrendous. Uh, the currents average between two and four knots at any time uh, during diving operations. So essentially it's like a flag on a flagpole for the diver. It's very difficult. And visibility averages uh, anywhere from uh, six inches to two feet, which is very limited. It's much less than a meter. Um, has there been uh, um, interest from, for example, from the Navy or the government about the, your discovery? I would have thought that the Navy would be particularly interested. Yes, well, you're correct. Uh, the Navy had much more interest than even we expected. Uh, we do know that uh, the initial stages of our federal action, we filed federally for, for the rights on this vessel. And uh, as soon as we did that, there was uh, heavy opposition voiced by the Department of State through the Department of Justice. These are typical government organs at work. Uh, we knew we were onto something sensitive when we started receiving this, this information. Uh, what surprised us most was uh, just uh, in 1997, September of 97, 
we have a restraining order on the site, a federally issued restraining order, which even the military has to honor. What happened was, in se the end of September, September 30th specifically of 1997, the U.S. Navy attempted to violate that restraining order, proceed to the site on their own with subcontracted vessels, civilian boats contracted by the Navy, and put divers down the boat, obviously in an attempt to remove sensitive items. Now, I would have thought that was a relatively easy thing to do while you're on the shore for them to dive on. Well, we noticed them within hours. Uh, certainly, we caught them before they were able to deploy their divers. One, they had to locate it exactly. They had to locate the, the vessel exactly, which we had not given them the exact latitude, longitude of the wreck. So it took them time to do that. And also, a lot of the civilian crew on the contracted vessels were bragging about going to the U-boat site on Nantucket. So our people, some of which are on Nantucket Island, had heard about this. And so it didn't take us long to mobilize and get into action. And we called everyone from the State Department to the U.S. Navy and voiced our complaints politely but firmly and also called the federal court, who were ready to take action at a moment's notice against uh, any government agency violating this order. So uh, we did stop the, the attempt, but it was a close call. So how did you actually um, get through to the, the, the boats on the surface that, um, that their presence wasn't really uh, wanted there? Well, I'm sure uh, what happened, uh, probably the biggest uh, influence in that was the media. Uh, it, the, next, uh, the next day after this started, uh, we had a press coverage, a small press article, uh, which I've given you a copy of. And it didn't take the Navy long to catch on to that and realize the media was on to them. And these people don't operate well outside shadows. Once you shed a light on them, they disappear. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we didn't have to initiate the federal action, thank God. We didn't have to get the federal marshal up into it because they got the message loud and clear, not to mention me calling every admiral in the Pentagon I can think of, and talking to the actual site commanders in Chatham, the land-based commander, and convincing him that it was a federally filed site and that it would not be in his best interest to proceed. So uh, it worked out well as it turned out, but for a while we were scared. What about the Coast Guard? The Coast Guard were very helpful. They, uh, they don't get involved as a policy with Navy operations, uh, but they helped us in any way they could, and they did some favors for us. Um, just give us an idea of the kind of uh, um, uh, what you might find when you finally do um, uh, get down into the wreck and, and open it up. What kind of things are you sort of, what sort of things are you expecting? Oh, I hate to speculate. Documentation, I know. I know we will find documentation. What kind of documentation is anybody's guess? My personal best guess would be documentation reflecting an armistice deal, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there could be reference to securities, uh, securities transfers, security placements, what have you. For all I know, there could be Swiss bank account numbers. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And it could be actual securities. I just, there's no way of knowing this. But we do know that uh, there will be re uh, records referring to the negotiations then ongoing between the uh, Nazi industrialists, anti-Nazis, if you will, and U.S. intelligence. But this is a U-boat. It's not designed to carry um, silver or gold or whatever the, the Nazis might have been oh, trying course to get not. from Argentina. Well, this, this is a warship, but it was a warship that could, that could carry 600 deadweight tons of cargo without affecting a trim. So she was more than capable of performing a dual role. Well, there's not many warships that were, uh, or not many, certainly submarines, that would be able to carry cargo, surely. No. No, this was a special boat. She's 115 meters in length. Uh, she's in feet, she's 32 feet wide. So, uh, and she's 40 feet from the conning tower to keel. That's a very big submarine. In fact, it's larger than our present day Los Angeles class attack submarines. Yes, so she is very capable. She's armed with uh, twin armored turrets, uh, each uh, carrying a twin barrel 127 millimeter gun. So uh, she had a lot of firepower as well as a lot of cargo capacity. To increase her cargo capacity, they could have removed a lot of her shells and powder from her armories. So, and each, each one of those armories can carry at least 200 tons uh, individually, so. Okay, can you take us through the uh, events? Okay, so it's been the the, um, 
blimp has depth charged the boat. Mm -hmm. what, what what does it look like happened? So that and the and the boat uh, then dived and the set the depth charge off. Can you just take us through that kind of process? Yes. Uh, what we've got so far in preliminary assessments on looking at the at the wreck site and uh, looking at the surrounding shoal, it's obvious she was uh, commencing a dive at the time she received an attack uh, and the one depth charge going off. At that point, the equilibrium was thrown off and she started commenced flooding. She's still proceeding on a headway. In other words, she's still going forward. At the time she's doing this, she's kicking over to one side or the other, port or starboard. Now, the mounts that are, are on her main deck level are gravity mounted. They're so heavy. They're gravity mounted. They probably weigh at least 12 tons apiece. And what happened, obviously, was one of those turrets actually fell off when she took an extreme list, uh, probably to starboard. That would be our best guess. And as a result, that armored mount settled upside down in the sand some ways away from the final resting place of the wreck, say approximately 100 meters. Uh, we've located that armored mount, and it's full of sand upside down at the bottom, and it's quite a sight. And she proceeded, say another 100 meters, eventually coming to rest against a sand shoal in very shallow water, approximately 60 feet. But she sanded up very quickly. And that is why she was very hard to detect even today because she, she constantly covers and uncovers with sand by as much as 10 or 20 feet sometimes. So even though she's a big boat, it's a big ocean and it's a lot of sand. So, but in most cases she's almost always exposed from the main deck up. Okay, uh, going back to the uh, possible securities on board, is it most likely to have been gold, do you think, if, if there was? I hate Obviously to... we still don't know. Well, I really hate to speculate on anything to do with securities. Uh, there, anything is possible. Yeah. So you're saying that it, it, it's possible that the boat was making a stop off uh, or, or at Cape Cod and then was heading down to Argentina with the securities, possibly. That is uh, the indication given. Was there, were there other um, similar U-boat missions earlier during the war then? Most definitely. We've confirmed at least three U-boat missions to South America carrying securities under what, we, what the Allies call safe haven and what the Germans call act in Fuhrland. We don't know which U-boats, but we do know they arrived, and we have Argentine intelligence documents confirming that they were spotted unloading actual securities. And there are records existing of the securities deposit in the Banco Alamán Transatlantico and the Banco Tornquist in downtown Buenos Aires, facilitated by the Sullivan Cromwell offices, which is a law firm that just happens to be uh, Alan Dulles's law firm. So. So what happened to this money? Any idea? Oh, it disappeared. Even today's uh, recent inquiries uh, on the Holocaust assets inquiry conducted by the State Department failed to address entirely the Argentine involvement of these securities. We find that very interesting. Uh, we have very strong indication, in fact, there is actually proof that a lot of these securities actually were transferred later to New York City uh, at, the, the at the Federal, Federal Reserve in New York. And uh, when that happened, that was 1950. They were subsequently uh, reschmelted in the USSA bars from Nazi gold bars. The U.S. Federal Reserve did this now. That's documented. And they were sent on to Germany in 1950. There's your great German rebuilding program right there. Nazi money used to rebuild Germany with U.S. complicity. So do you think that there was some kind of um, relationship then between people like the Dulles brothers and, and um, some... A German industrialist. Most definitely. There is no doubt about that. All of the history about the Dulles brothers, both Alan and John Foster, and their relationships with all the German industrialists that we've researched are very positive, very firm. They represented them in numerous lawsuits before, during, uh, before and after the war. No doubt about it. Even the head of the Bank for International Settlements, McKittrick, Thomas McKittrick, was Alan Dulles's personal client in 1946. And BIS, as everyone knows, was very guilty of laundering Nazi money before, during, after the war. Okay, so what, what's the situation now? Um, are you going to be, um, um, or what's the, what's the next step for you um, with, with this boat, with the U-boat? What's, uh, what's going to be happening next? Oh, the next step uh, is going to be interesting. Uh, as I said, we're proceeding cautiously. But uh, once we uh, penetrate this vessel, it'll go very quickly. We have to do it properly. We have an archaeologist for that, too. 
Uh, we fully plan to address all of the concerns of all governments and uh, histo historians. Our objective is to preserve everything recovered, no matter what it may be, and use it for public dissemination. They're going to know that the, the world is going to know what's in this boat. It's as simple as that. And we're going to do our best to make it happen. Okay, that'll do fine. Very, uh, thanks very much, Ed. We were being recording, Mum. I didn't know. I know you didn't. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have told you. <laughs> oh, what are you doing, you stupid machine? Did it record? Uh, well, I hope so.